Uh, the points of disagreement uh, may vary from place to place and from time to time. But marvellously, the principles that God lays down for us in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the grace of Christ will never vary. Uh, they will apply to every case, wherever Christians are, and whatever their differences in matters of indifference may be. Because remember, we're looking at Christian liberty as it's exercised in matters of indifference or uh, in those matters where the law of God is not speaking to us, requiring one thing of us and forbidding the other. <laughs> there are a host of things in our lives that though important and all to be brought into the service of God in obedience, uh, are, are not morally binding upon all in the same way and at the same time. So a couple of those things come out here in Romans 14 as major issues for the early church. There was the matter of the eating of meats and the drinking of wine. And uh, so the Apostle Paul is turning our attention to that. So bear in mind this is matters of indifference. So let's look at our Christian liberty. And first of all, here in verses 1 through 3, we've got the matter of receiving the weaker brother. Have you notice in verse 1, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. So it's that reception of the weaker brother that is right on the foreground. See it again in verse 3. Uh, Don't judge him that eats, says Paul. Why? For God hath received him. So it's that reception of the, the Christian brother and the weaker brother that's right in the foreground. So we're going to look then at receiving the weaker brother. So we're going to ask ourselves, who is this weaker brother? What is he? How are we to receive him? And why is that so important? So what is the weaker brother? How should we receive him? Why so important? Okay, let's, let's approach this question uh, from the practical viewpoint that Paul leads us into here. Uh, the weaker brother in Romans 14 was that Christian man or woman uh, who felt conscience bound to keep certain holy days, to observe holy days, or to eat herbs rather than eat meats under certain circumstances, and not to drink wine. They were the issues that were there. So their conscience before God said to them, it's wrong for me uh, if I don't keep these holy days. I'm displeasing God. So I've got to keep the holy days. And they thought to themselves, it's wrong for me to eat meat offered to idols. I'd rather just eat herbs. I won't, I won't eat that meat. And so they got this conscience. It's wrong for me, they said, uh, to drink wine. I won't do it. So that's the issue. That's the weaker brother being described there. And that weakness is called a weakness in, in the faith. <laughs> and it's a weakness among them as Christians because the church in Rome was not restrict, restricted to one group of people. They weren't just Jews and they weren't just Gentiles. They were a mixture of both. And uh, as a mixture of Jew and Gentiles, they approach their life in quite different ways. And I, I can't help but reflect upon uh, what I've observed as a Christian minister over 30 years in various congregations and places around the world. And uh, how I've observed that in certain places, Christians are very concerned about certain things which in other places they're not concerned about hardly at all, I'm not even aware of. And uh, if you were to throw them together, uh, you would have an immediate issue about how to deal with and receive the weaker brother. And I think to myself, I've observed in families how that some families have major concerns in their minds about certain things, and it's usually rooted in where they've come from in the past and the perception they have about things now, whereas other families, even in the same congregation, 
can have quite a different understanding of that and approach to it. So, so that's that's the reality of what the church is dealing with. Now, as Paul writes this, it's Jews and Gentiles thrown together. The Jewish Christians, owing to their previous education in all the rites and ceremonies under the law of Moses, and all the training up that they had about what their conscience should be concerned about, <laughs> they had what you have to call a very imperfect or flawed understanding of what it meant that Jesus Christ had come and fulfilled all those requirements of the law and set them free from the ceremonies of the Old Testament. They didn't, it didn't twig with them. It, it didn't follow through. It, they, they hadn't followed through what it meant to be complete in Christ and justified in Christ and free in Christ. They were still bound up with much of their previous way of thinking. Okay? Well, on the other hand, you've got some Gentile Christians who had been idol worshippers and were, would, were remembering the abominations of idolatry and how they used to take their meats and their food and offer them to the idols. And only when they were dedicated uh, in the service of the idols would they eat them. They'd come out of paganism. And now for them it was an abhorrent thing uh, for them to eat meat that had been offered to idols because they associated it with everything that they had in their former life. The Apostle Paul addresses both those things in passing through this chapter. And he says, in effect, that those Jewish Christians don't understand yet the freedom they have, and they're weaker in that area. Weaker brethren. And he looks at some of these Gentile Christians and he says, they don't understand yet that meat being offered to idols doesn't change the nature of the meat. If you don't worship the idol, the meat's the thing indifferent. You could eat it or not, doesn't matter. They don't understand that yet. They're weaker in that area. So that's the sort of thing that he's dealing with. And the point, one of the points that's really significant for, for us here, and we should try and learn this and carry it with us, is that we all suffer in one way or another from partial ignorance. Ever thought about that? The way your family does it, or the way my family does it, is not necessarily right. It might have all manner of blind spots, ignorances, failures to understand the freedom we have in Christ attached to it. But it's our way of doing Christianity. We pass it on to our children. It's a remarkable thing that kids... Kids tend to think that the way mum and dad, dad do it and the way we do it at home, well, that's the best way. And everybody else in comparison, well, they haven't quite got it right. That's not the way we do it. And that, that's, that's true, isn't it? That's the way we sort of come into our Christian lives as young people in Reformed churches even. Well, let's learn that, that you and I, all of us, really do suffer from partial ignorance. We are imperfect in our understanding of the faith and what Jesus Christ means in every aspect of our life. That's a, that's a hugely important point to actually come to in our thinking. Uh, that, that, that will give us, if we come to that, it will give us a humble willingness to learn Uh, we'll be ready and in the right frame of mind uh, to have our understanding and our mistaken notions and ideas corrected. So that, that's, that's, that's a challenging thing. Uh, it, it might be you that's wrong, not the other person. And in fact, the whole of the Christian community uh, should come humbly to the word of God and to the gospel of Jesus Christ to be taught. That's its unifying principle. So a humble willingness to accept that we might be wrong. The Apostle 
Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, which by the way is a parallel chapter on Christian liberty. Uh, he, he, he says there in verse 1 and 2, Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. And if any man thinks that he knows anything, well, he knows nothing yet, as he ought to know. And that's quite something, isn't it? So a principle of humility and an acknowledgement that given the fact that in the Christian church there's stronger and weaker brothers, there might be occasions where you and I are the weaker brother. We haven't quite got it right. So what will we do with that? Uh, when the Christian church is is engaging now with a weaker brother, what, what, what will we do with it? How will we respond? Should, should we uh, view it this way? That the weaker brother needs me or he needs you with your clearer and better knowledge uh, to sit him down and to set his head straight. Is that what's needed? Uh, oughtn't we tackle him with his mistaken views? Oughtn't we discuss it and even argue it out with him and set him straight if he's wrong or she? Is that what Jesus Christ wants us to do whenever we get the opportunity with a weaker brother? That's interesting, isn't it? Because the problem is a clear knowledge and understanding of how Christ applies to all the areas of life and we think we've got it. Shouldn't we just sit him down and set him straight and set him free? Well, the Apostle Paul is saying to us here, well, actually, no, that's, that's not the way. Uh, he says here, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. So that's a way of saying, no, that's not what I would have you do. So let's look at that for a moment. We are to receive him, but not to doubtful disputations. Well, this command, uh, I think, brethren, if we stand back and look at it, it implies that the majority of the church were what you could describe as the stronger brethren. So that there is, there is a majority report, there's a majority view, there's a, there's a prevailing understanding in the Christian church uh, concerning the liberty that Christ has given to us. So th that's implied here. And then you've got a a weaker brother or a weaker component who comes and in a sense is a little bit like a square peg in a round hole. They, they, they don't fit. Their thinking's not the same. They, they, there's a weakness. So a majority of the church and a weaker brother. Well, it's to be hoped, isn't it, that the true church, which is diligent to thoroughly train and ground its members and ministers of the gospel with a comprehensive knowledge of the faith, it's to be hoped that that sort of church uh, would, as it's taught the whole counsel of God, find itself uh, in a position of strength not to be the weaker brother. That's probably usually the case, but one would think not necessarily always the case. Sometimes church communions get off on a tangent and make a matter of indifference into a matter of principle. And it's quite possible and conceivable that church communities, uh, in certainly in, in more isolated circumstances, can become peculiar. <laughs> and uh, 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 what is really a, a weakness uh, becomes the prevailing opinion of that church. That's something to be very much guarded against. And that's one of the great benefits, isn't it, of the true church being in communion and in broader connection with other true churches in the world so that there's always that balance and engagement that we have so we don't become peculiar and sectarian with, with our weaknesses. But in, in the ordinary course of events where the church itself represents the freedom we have in Christ. Well, it belongs then, doesn't it, to the majority to receive the minority and not the other way around. That's 
the emphasis and, and viewpoint of the passage. Uh, so we, we can learn from that that it's not the Lord's will that the weaker brother and the minority should be pressured into conforming or renouncing their views to fit in with the expectations of the majority in matters of indifference. You can't make agreement with you in conformity uh, to uh, the strength, a qualification for fellowship. That's really what's being said here. To the most knowledgeable and the strongest in the congregation and in the church and to the strongest church, Christ is saying, receive him that is weak in the faith. Now that's, that's, a, that's an incredibly important requirement of us. Receive him that is weak in the faith and not to doubtful disputations. Okay, so what does this receiving mean? Well, it does not mean that you allow them to become a member of the church because as it appears in this passage, this person is already a member of the church. Through their confession of faith, of the faith in Jesus Christ, they've come into the membership of the church and now it's a matter of living together within the church. So both the stronger and the weaker are members in the true church and that really becomes the basis for them to be received in the manner of being spoken of here. So if it's not that, what is it? Well, it is to receive that person so that we don't erect a barrier between us and them that keeps them at a distance, greater or lesser distance, but rather we warmly welcome them and embrace them in Christ as our friends, as our brothers and sisters with an unqualified, now this is really important, with an unqualified affection so that they have just as real a place and just as close and just as positive a place in our lives as do the strong. That's what it means to receive them. No second class citizens. You don't quite do it and think the way we do. Therefore, you're a second class. Well, you're in the church, but we really won't have much to do with you. Our family, our people do it this other way. So you can be over there, but we'll be here. You make us a bit uncomfortable with your difference. So you can be there and we'll be here. That's exactly what the apostle is saying. No, don't do that. Receive them. No second class citizens. No discrimination with respect to confidence or affection between the weaker and the stronger. No dividing up into us and them, cliques and parties within the church. No silent shutting them out because their views place a little bit of unease or strain on the relationship. Or because, now this is really important, think about this, no excluding them in any way because their conscience restricts you from doing what you'd like to do. Think about that in our Australian culture. The weaker brother is to be welcomed into our unhindered fellowship as a valued, respected brother or sister in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is requiring of us here. That's what the Holy Spirit I believe is requiring of us here. Now, the significance of that is greatly emphasized when you see how the, the word received is used twice here in these verses. Uh, there's a calling to receive them, and there's the admonition to do so because God has received them. That, that couldn't really be emphasized more. Uh, he, he's, he's received them, now, now so must we. So that's the receiving. What about the doubtful disputations? So you're going to receive them. How will you deal with the issues? Are we, are we going to talk about them all the time and nag at them and try and correct them? 
not to doubtful disputations. And that literally means uh, not to a situation where there's always decisions and questions being uh, put. Uh, not, not, a, not into a situation where the views are always under assessment and judgment. That's the idea of it. So the strong should not attempt <laughs> to decide the points of difference between themselves and the weak by inviting the weak to discuss them with them and keeping on doing so. They should not receive the weaker brother for the purpose of subject, subjecting his convictions and thoughts to critical scrutiny. I'll come around for a cup of tea. I really want to talk to you about this matter. And when they get there, uh, open your Bible. Let's have a look at this. Uh, let's work this through. Let me show you where you're wrong. Uh, let, let's have a debate about this. We're all under the word of God. Let God sort it out. Here, open your Bible and I'll show you. No, we should not be receiving the weaker brother for the purpose of subjecting their convictions and thoughts to the scrutiny of our own judgment. And that means that the weaker brother, as they come into an environment that's not full of doubtful disputations, uh, will not be in a situation where they don't feel free uh, to express themselves and just to serve the Lord for openly and at peace. Uh, they should not be in a situation where they feel uh, that they're being pressured and harassed and uh, being forced to conform. Now, Robert Haldane in his, in his commentary on Romans had something really interesting, useful to say here. This is how he describes this not to doubtful disputations. He says, such conduct would either tend to wound their mind or induce them to acquiesce or fall in with you without enlightened conviction. Disputation, says Haldane, seldom begets agreement. If a statement of the will of Christ from the scriptures has not the effect of producing conviction, lengthened discussions are more likely to increase prejudice than to resolve doubts. While therefore it is greatly important that believers who have inadequate views on any part of divine truth should be taught more fully the way of the Lord, it is also true that the most likely way to effect this is to avoid disputations with them on the points on which they are weak. This observation is founded on experience and it is warranted by the command of God. To push them forward faster than they are taught by the word and spirit of God will stumble and injure instead of making them strong. Christians seldom argue one another into their views and more frequently each is more confirmed in his own opinion. When it's necessary to show the weak brother his errors, it is best to exhibit the truth in its evidences, to leave him to the general use of the means of edification, to let him go to church and to the meetings in peace, and to give him affectionate instructions for the purpose of his becoming stronger in the faith and riper in his judgment. By the, no, catch this, by the internal influences and teaching of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that something? So how is this reception going to deal with the weakness? Well, it's going to allow the Holy Spirit in his time and in his way to use the means of grace as we sit together under the teaching and preaching of the word to lay the foundations in truth which when they work themselves through into a person's thinking and life over a period of time will set them free. And as that takes place, they in their conscience before God, being instructed by God and the Holy Spirit, will take up that view, not in order to fit in, not in order to conform, not in order to be accepted by the, ch the church and its people, but because... They follow their God in their conscience. And that's 
what the means of grace aim at. That's what the Christian church is all about. That's what Christ desires from his people, that they should follow him with an instructed mind, with a conscience that's been brought into subjection to him as their Lord, and they should do it by faith. <laughs> so the very worst thing you can do uh, to someone is put them in a situation where they conform to fit in and they become people who are doing something it's even against their conscience in order to be part comfortably of our fellowship. You see? That's critically important. The apostle will go on later in chapter 14 and, and he'll say that a person who does fit in like this, verse 23, though he's doubting, is damned. Why? Aren't they doing the right thing? He that doubts is damned if he eats. Why? Because he eats not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We'll talk about that later, but that's significant. So the Christian church may not, ought not, must avoid the situation where people who have a conscience that would carry them in another way, in a matter of indifference, are forced to conform and they do something that they themselves think is wrong in order to fit in with us. So they are to be received, but not uh, to doubtful disputations. Now, why is that so important? Well, first off, brethren, it's important because uh, those weaker brothers or sisters with their honest-hearted conscience before God are in the faith. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, says Paul. Now, that being in the faith is a little bit different to saying that they have faith. They have, that they have faith is, is implied, it's assumed here. Now, they've professed faith in Jesus Christ and so they're part of the church. But now they're looked at as those who are in the faith they're in the faith. So those cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith, which are, which are the very foundation for a person's union with Christ and salvation, are in place with these people. They, 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 they're not legalists in the sense that they are going to trust in their own works of righteousness to present them as acceptable to God or any such thing. They're not doing what they're doing. In order to become saved, they're doing what they're doing because as saved people, they want to please God. They're in the faith. But, as we mentioned before, the way that the faith addresses all the different aspects of life and sets them free, they don't quite understand clearly yet. But they are in the faith. And so we are not to question that they are in the faith because they might differ with us on matters of indifference. So important. The matters over which there is a difference are not essential for salvation. And so yeah, they can be left alone. Those matters can be left alone without any, any fear that that person will go lost because they've embraced a soul-destroying error. They can be left alone and they can go to heaven without mistaken notion, just like we will go to heaven with all the mistaken notions that still cleave to us. And so with that in view, those sort of things, matters of indifference, even when it's a somewhat aggravating and annoying thing and it gets in the way of what you'd like to do, those sort of things ought not ever be allowed to become the cause of alienation or division between Christian brethren. And it's important also because the Church of Jesus Christ is the place where all manner of people are gathered by Christ to be taught. Here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, day after day, year after year in the course of our life. 
We, we, we gather and if we're not so full of ourselves that we think we know everything already, uh, we'll continue to learn and be taught and we'll grow together. And if that's going to happen, the church needs to be an environment of gracious, patient understanding on the part of all those who have already learned. And that's, that's so practically important. Church, the church is not designed to be a little enclave of people who've, who've lived their whole life in their generations back as far as they can remember, who've always understood and known the same things and been taught from their childhood up. The church is designed to be a place where, yes, covenant children are taught and nurtured, and there's a great privilege to that. And some of us here would never have known what it means to be in bondage to many of these weaknesses because the Reformed faith is a heritage of freedom. It's such a well-balanced, ordered thing that shows us how Christ is sufficient in all areas of our life and it gives us a marvellous, informed, holy freedom. But there's other people who, who are brought in from, you could say, the grossest, darkest ignorance and paganism like they were in Rome. And, and those people come in not like a blank slate, but full of all sorts of history and, and, and mixed up ideas from the past. And, and those, all those ideas and mixed up notions, uh, they, they, they interact with Christianity and, and, and every confusion along the way has to be cleared up. And only as those confusions are cleared up and the truth takes its place and casts its light into the life, do those people actually, actually understand their Christian freedom in that area of life and can, in a conscience-governed life, walk by faith. But until they do, they have to be taught. And while they're mixed up, they have to be received. And as they're received, they have to know they have to know, they have to feel, they have to experience the fact and reality that they are not in any way viewed as a problem or as a trouble to the church or as an interference in our lives. No, they're viewed as of vital importance and their growth and their development in faith, not their conformity to our expectations, but their growth and development in faith and understanding is our great Concern. And the stronger a Christian is, the more patient and, and, and vitally interested in that spiritual growth they should be. It's not all about outward conformity. It's not all about external actions, our Christianity. It, it's about our engagement through faith with an obedient heart with the Lord Jesus Christ and God in him. And the actions follow. And that would be true, brethren, even if the weaker brother seems to be pushing his barrow and aggravating us. Even if they seem to be asking for it. Still, they are to be received without doubtful disputations. There will be occasions in the life of the church where a, a weaker brother who becomes just too pushy has to be quietly admonished behind the scenes uh, that in these very principles we're talking about. But the church needs to be an environment where they can be added and exist and flourish. And uh, in closing, it's important because receiving the brother in this way, the weaker brother, is not a compromise and it's not a loss of your freedom. It's actually the consistent application of the faith to this aspect of our life in Christ together. And that's important. The apostle is not proceeding on the principle that the views of those who differ among themselves are equally well founded. He's not saying like the unbelieving relativist world in which we live, that every person's got their own truth. you got your truth, i got mine. It's both equally valid. Therefore, let's just throw it all together and let's not worry about the differences and contradictions. He's not saying that. 
the Bible does not ever go there. God is truth. God's word is truth. The truth that's revealed to us is, is not ambiguous. It's not contradictory. The, the scripture doesn't ever let us uh, go into the realm of that relativism. But the apostle is proceeding on the basis that the strong and weak are brethren. And he's got in view the glory of God and our obedience to his will together as individuals and together. And, and that as our Heavenly Father is so very indulgent and patient with us as his children and notwithstanding all our defects and our, and our weakness in knowledge and, 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 and our consequent mix-up in life and confusion and the differences it creates in the conduct between different Christians, as God bears with us, notwithstanding all that, and as God continues patiently to work in our life to conform us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ and into the freedom that he's given us, then, and here's the point, how could we be less forbearing and understanding of one another than what God is with us. That's the point. Now that, brethren, is the faith applied to this area of our lives. God has received him. How can you do less? How can you do other? The omniscient God, the God who sees and knows everything exactly as it is, has received you and has received the weaker brother together with you, all your imperfect knowledge for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. And so to you, for Christ's sake, can receive the weaker brother. And if you are the weaker brother, uh, you can lovingly receive the stronger brother and not get yourself all bent out of shape and all aggravated because everybody's not conforming to your understanding. So that's the faith. It frees us from pride. It makes us humble, not haughty. It makes us patient, not pushy. <laughs> it, 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 it makes us able to communicate, not to become preachy all the time. And, and it will make us humble and gracious to other imperfect, erring, mixed up, misguided, still learning people like us. Because we know that I'm, we're just like them in so many ways. And we're in it together. And Jesus Christ, the great prophet, is, is teaching us all. And may he do it in a way that brings us closer together and if our consciences differ, we should do it in love, in Christ Jesus. Now, who can't see that the, that the unity of the body of Christ, as it comes to expression in the visible church, demands that? We can all see that, can't we? Now, how could the church, with all the diverse people, with all the diverse backgrounds, with all the different mixed-up ideas of of where they're at in this particular point in their lives, how, how could it ever live together without that principle of unity in Christian freedom? The church cannot exist without it. And it's part of the package that you get when you're united to Christ for your salvation. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to touch upon some of these subjects, important subjects uh, in your word this afternoon. So much more, Lord, that needs to be said. Uh, but Lord, we thank you for these things and we pray that uh, you might actually lead us on and equip and prepare us in this little congregation and all those who listen uh, so that your, your church, your congregations, might be places uh, where you can bring 
the weak, the halt, the lame, uh, to be healed and to be strengthened and to be taught and to be helped towards heaven. So grant us your grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>